Welcome to the OnScript podcast, your home for world-class conversations on scripture and theology, where you get to meet some of the best in the field. Visit us at onscript.study. Say hello on Twitter at OnScript Podcast and stop by our Facebook page at facebook.com slash OnScript. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the OnScript Podcast. This is Matt Lynch. I'm a co-host along with Matt Bates, Drew Johnson, Aaron Heim, Chris Tilling, and Amy Brown-Hughes. Thanks so much for tuning in. Before we get going, I want to say thanks to Ed Hackey for producing the show, to Rebecca Terhune for marketing and media help, to James Steinbach for his assistance with the website and the web hosting challenges, and to George Courage and Miriam Ward for helping design our new logo, which is, uh, you can view that on our social media pages, Twitter, Facebook, etc., So, uh, yeah, I'm really happy with how that logo came out. So do check it out. And as I said in previous episodes, we, we will be, um, making some, some, something available, uh, for people to purchase if they, they want on script related paraphernalia like doilies. That's the one idea that we've had so far. Um, we're a creative bunch here and that's the kind of thing we, we, uh, tend to thrive on. Um, so We've got a really special episode here with Dr. Will Gaffney, and I've been wanting to have her on the show for a while, and finally we were able to make that happen, so I hope you enjoy this episode with her on her book, Womanist Midrash, a fascinating book. I definitely encourage you to pick it up, check it out, and uh, read through it. Okay, um, without further ado, here it is. Welcome back to Unscript, everybody. I'd like to introduce our guest today. Dr. Will Gaffney is professor of Hebrew Bible at Bright Divinity School in Fort Worth, Texas. She's the author of Daughters of Miriam, Women, Prophets in Ancient Israel, and Womanist Midrash, a reintroduction to women of the Torah and of the throne that we're going to be talking about today. She's also co-edited several books. She's an Episcopal priest, former army chaplain, and congregational pastor in the AME Zion Church. She's also active on Twitter at Will Gaffney, W-I-L-G-A-F-N-E-Y, if you'd like to follow her there. Welcome to OnScript. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Yeah, um, I was intrigued to see Army Chaplain uh, among the many items on your your resume. Uh, do you want to just tell us a little bit about that specific experience? I, I think a lot of our, our guests have, you know, experiences in in synagogue and church or academy, but army chaplains a bit different. I was a chaplain in the reserve component while I was in graduate school. I was in a mili- mil- excuse me in a medical unit that was uh, deployable to Fort Bragg. We did our reserve training in uh, locally in the Durham area and at the VA hospital in Durham that was right across from Duke and the hospital there. So I had responsibility for the soldiers in my unit, but also the patients that we were caring for since our primary mission as a unit was patient care. So sometimes that meant that I was doing uh, all levels of the hospital, Malcolm Grow Army Hospital on Fort Bragg, But often I found myself uh, in the psych ward because I had experience with with veterans and I had done my CPE training earlier than other chaplains would have in the Army paradigm and you needed CPE credentialing to work in the hospital. So between my experience with um, St. Elizabeth Hospital in Washington, D.C., where I did my CPE residency, the VA hospitals, and then uh, the Army hospital, I found myself uh, in a psychiatric chaplain role most of the time. So what would you say is the impact of working as an Army Reserve chaplain, um, and specifically, you know, working in the psych ward and and, um, some of those more challenging areas on your ministry and your scholarship? Particularly as a pastor, I'm very much aware of the needs of military families, which quite frankly are not well met by civilian congregations. The lingering effects of what we now call moral injury as a result of having been in, seen, uh, and experienced war, uh, those 
those memories linger for a lifetime. The harm done can linger for a lifetime. And uh, veterans with PTSD can struggle as much in their 60s as they did in their 20s. So that awareness is really in my, uh, the pastoral side of my work. In terms of my scholarship, it means that I'm less likely to dismiss accounts of violence, genocidal violence in the conquest narratives or other portions of scripture as simply literary devices. Without regard to historicity, I'm not making any claims here, but taking seriously that language of slaughter is used regularly in our scriptures as a way of advancing um, God's aims in the world. Uh, I take seriously what those theological claims are and whether or not that is something we wish to ascribe to God, even though it is in our sacred texts. Yeah. And, and do you find that same struggle with Army veterans as well? I'm not working in an active ministry setting with uh, veterans. And so when I have uh, one or more in a congregation, uh, sometimes they make themselves known, but I don't always know that I have veterans in the room specifically, although statistically, of course, you know that you do. Um, so you describe yourself in the book as a God and Torah wrestling woman. So as you look back and, and trace the paths of your you know, journey into scholarship and your relationship with, with the Bible, um, what kinds of wrestling matches do you recall most vividly? Wrestling matches. I think that what I remember most early on was trying to make sense of stories that didn't speak to God as I understood God. And I had the privilege of being in environments where you could question and ask. And for me as a black person and as a black woman, some of those questions emerged around enslavement. Uh, the ubiquity of slavery in the ancient world, uh, the way that is not only presented as normative, but as something God participated in, uh, that God rewards patriarchs like Abraham uh, with persons in his household, and those persons include enslaved persons, and that uh, slavery is codified in the New Testament with the expectation of obedience being now a Christian virtue and the language of slavery on the lips of Jesus. And even though we have the rubric in which he says, uh, the one whom the son sets free is free indeed, uh, Jesus did not speak against the literal enslavement of human persons and did not deliver any human persons to liberation from their enslavement. And there is that story where a young man was raised from the dead and given back to his enslaver. And uh, that sort of cuts across the experience I have as a person who grew up listening to spirituals that said, before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave. So the issues of slavery across the canon uh, were some of my earliest wrestlings. So um, given the ubiquity of that um, reality in scripture. What do you think it is that kept you from just walking away from it? I knew that I encountered God in and through the text. And I also love literature, love reading. Um, the stories are so vivid. The text is so diverse. The text has always engaged and captivated me. And even as I was wrestling with it, Frankly, it never occurred to me to walk away. I didn't understand the all or none paradigm that I would see fundamentalists and atheists who can be another sort of fundamentalist uh, insist upon in the text. Um, and of course, there's the model of Jesus who says rather frequently, you have heard it written, but I say unto you, and it's clear from the way uh, characters like Paul use the text that it's available for reinterpretation and reinterpretation in ways that are quite different than its original contextual literary setting. Hmm. 
Yeah, that's a good segue to your book, Womanist Midrash, uh, because it has in the subtitle a reintroduction to the women of the Torah and the throne. So, so what is it about the women in the Hebrew Bible that needed a reintroduction? Well, Hebrew Bible is, of course, my academic specialty and the place of my deepest interest. And a reintroduction in the sense that I would argue that even those of us who study this text deeply simply do not know all of the characters that are available to be known. My uh, dissertation advisor uh, came up with the number of 111 named women in the Hebrew scriptures while she was working on a dictionary project. And while I could name a couple dozen, I knew I could not name 111. And it was very clear to me that those of us who specialize in this text could not do so, and certainly those for whom the text is still uh, somewhat distant or who are used to hearing lectionary portions or sermons that only deal on three, four, or five women. So a reintroduction really to the Hebrew scriptures uh, might be a better way of thinking about it. But using these characters, whether they're larger characters with whom someone might be familiar or characters in a very small portion of text, to ask the theological questions that we've been asking already and see if the claims we make about God hold true in the experiences of these characters. And if not, how do we need to revise our theology to account for their place in the canon and what theologies they might invite us to from their perspective, often on the margins? So your, your main title is Womanist Midrash, and those are two terms that maybe not all of our listeners are going to be familiar with. Could you just give a, a thumbnail sketch of what womanist biblical interpretation is and then uh, what Midrash involves? Most simply, Womanism is black women's feminism. It is a thicker, richer, deeper feminism, as Alice Walker, who coined the term womanist and womanism, says that womanist is to feminist as purple is to lavender. In terms of the ways the two types of feminisms differ, uh, white feminism has largely focused on access and acquisition, getting a place at the table, rather than the structural analysis of why there are tables without enough seats. Um, womanism is intersectional. That means it attends to the different types of oppressions and their cumulative effects on Black women when you look at race and gender and ability, and economic status, and orientation, and many more. So womanism is a holistic approach. And because womanism seeks the well-being of the community, um, that means womanism extends to its embrace peoples of other races and ethnicities and genders, because our communities uh, include uh, people who are not like us and extend to the world, the earth, the ecology. Midrash is classical Jewish biblical interpretation. It has its roots in the biblical text in Hebrew. It is grammatical and translational. It also interprets the text asking questions about why the text is the way it is, looking at gaps in the story, and sometimes supplying them. It provides names for some characters, often female characters, and it seeks to make sense of the narratives uh, and the legal material on several different levels. Uh, Midrash is commonly known to people as a uh, rewritten Bible or uh, expanding a biblical story, telling a biblical story in the first person. Those are contemporary versions of Midrash, but this project is rooted in classical rabbinic midrash in terms of focusing on the text and translation issues. Yeah, um, I think that's I think that's a really helpful way of putting it because I think one misunderstanding of midrash is that this is they're essentially flights of fancy and imaginings uh, about the the world of the Bible or some some character in the story. But as you said, they're always anchored in some detail in 
in the text. Um, I remember my my wife took a class in Midrash and we were in Israel and um, with Enoch, it says he lived to 365 years and, but it has that detail where it says he, he walked with God for 300 years and then was no more. And so the rabbinic exegetes asked the question, well, what happened before the 300 years? You know, at 65, he must have had some kind of conversion and, and fill out that detail, but it is anchored in the details of the text. So, so what, what does, um, could you give an example? I, I really like the example you use right at the beginning of the book from Genesis 1, 2, um, where you um, attend to the, the dynamics, the gender dynamics in that verse. And um, could you just give our listeners a flavor of what this looks like in practice in that example, and then we'll look at some other ones. Certainly. So, womanist midrash uh, starts with the biblical text in biblical Hebrew, and the first layer is really translation. And there's a part of that that is almost uh, literal, uh, if you will. And so, in Genesis 1, uh, God is introduced, uh, Bereshit Bar Elohim, uh, when beginning he, God, created. Uh, the noun has a, a plural form that is uh, inclusive, but also masculine plural, but the verb is masculine singular. But in the second verse, uh, the Ruach Elohim, uh, al and the Spirit of God, she hovered or fluttered over the face of the waters. The verb is feminine, the noun is feminine, and so that is the sort of plain face of the text. My translation reflects that uh, he God created and the spirit she was hovering. So then we talk about the Midrashic piece, if you will, the interpretive piece, that God introduces God's self through the text using both genders, which were all that was available uh, in the language because of the binary nature of the Hebrew language and the binary understanding uh, of the culture. And so it's a way of God introducing God's self fulsomely. And then later, when humankind are created in that divine image, they reflect that image fully with uh, masculine and feminine language. And so it's a way of saying that uh, neither component of humanity is less than the other, and together uh, we are fully in the image of God. And, and then you go on and talk about Genesis 2 and the formation of the woman in that story. Um, what are some insights that a womanist approach might have to that story that perhaps a feminist approach wouldn't? Well, first let me say that womanist, womanists and feminists often ask the same questions. Womanists may go deeper or may extend out further. But f feminists, uh, white feminists, Christian feminists, Jewish feminists, feminist women have long looked at the passage that certain English translations render as rib uh, and dismissed it out of hand because every place uh, the word tzela is used in the Hebrew Bible, in the First Testament, it means side. It means hillside for terracing and agriculture. In terms of the temple doors, it means one side of a double swinging door. And a translation principle uh, called lexical fidelity is what governs me. And that is, if a word means a thing, you don't get to change the definition because you're dealing with a woman or female entity and you have a hierarchical understanding of gender. You are creating a hierarchy in that particular place where there is none. So there would really not be a significant difference between womanists and feminists in terms of how that text is translated. Yeah. Um, I, I was thinking, too, of the, the line that you had there. You said, you know, when uh, with, the, with the creation of the man and woman, that they're as as brown as the earth from which they were created, um, which is an interesting insight um, into that passage. When I when I thought about the characters that you were going to cover uh, before I'd read the book, uh, the one of the characters I was hoping you talked about was Rizpah. 
and and you had a se- you did have a section on her. Um, I wonder if you could explain why Rispa is so important to um, as a womanist interpreter. I grew up hearing uh, stories and sermons about Rispa. I grew up in a world in which there were women preachers, black women preachers, and having done the work on Rispa and been in conversation in addition to reflecting on my own upcoming, it's clear that Rispa is a favorite character of black women preachers. And even before the outpouring of rage and grief that kicked off the Black Lives Matter movement formally in the aftermath of the murder of Trayvon Martin, uh, there were obviously police killings and violence with which the black community has has lived and resisted uh, from the beginning of our time on this continent. And Ritzba is a mother whose sons were, in one translation, lynched uh, for political and theological and no good reason. And so this woman... Uh, protecting the bodies of her sons, the deceased bodies of her sons that are laying out, as now many, many years later, Mike Brown would be left to lie in the street, as would so many other victims of police shootings, and calling attention to the injustice done to her children. Um, that story is going to be resonant for for Black women and Black families for as long as we have murderous injustice in this country. Yeah, it was, it was a, um, it was a striking section of the book, um, in part because I'd never heard a sermon on Rispa before. And, uh, to hear you say that this is so common, um, in African-American churches, um, was a, a kind of a, a striking reminder of, of the, the difference even, um, you know, in the the way that I was sort of introduced to characters of the Bible, um, in in a context that prided itself on on being deeply biblical and attending to the whole text and carefully walking through the Bible, never ever heard a sermon on Rizpah. As you wrote this book, was there a character that you felt uh, surprisingly drawn to? You know, was there one that you didn't expect, and then as you wrote about them, you Uh, just became enamored with them. Yes, I would have to say that that was Ahinoam, uh, the wife of Saul. With these women characters, they are often introduced as wives and mothers. And they don't often show up later in the narrative. And so I adopted a strategy that if uh, there was no evidence that the woman died or was killed, she didn't die in childbirth, that the character was still alive as the male character, who's often the central focus, is going through his story. So I imagined, and we'll talk about sanctified imagination uh, next, because that's part of my midrashic process, but I imagined that for everything Saul went through, uh, that his wife was there. This new young man comes in, And Saul arranges engagements, uh, was she consulted? Even if culturally she was not consulted, there's no mother on earth who wouldn't have something to say after the fact. Saul ends an engagement, uh, breaks off a marriage. Then there's a period where Saul appears to be profoundly ill, perhaps mentally ill. Um, Saul is going to war. Uh, One of their sons dies. There are all of these events that a wife and mother would have something to say and certainly something to feel. So by positioning her as a companion character, uh, particularly as her daughters were uh, losing engagements, losing husbands, being married against their will, being taken captive, being brought back into unhappy marriages, having their children killed, um, there is room to create a robust portrait of this woman and imagine her and her feelings towards David, her feelings towards Saul, her feelings for her daughters, and certainly her feelings for her murdered grandchildren. And you you talk about the sanctified imagination as as something that 
is common in uh, African American preaching. So someone would say, "In my sanctified imagination," and that's a it's a kind of cue that they were going to riff on something at that point. Could you just explain what what that process is? So the preaching of the black church in in the varied forms of the black church and its varied forms of preaching has a number of commonalities and the most relevant one here is high regard for the biblical text. That can take different forms. For some, there are uh, folk who believe in a, in a literal reading of the text or will even make claims about inerrancy. But even for those who do not make those moves, there is high, serious regard for the holiness of the text. So preachers want to be careful to distinguish between what is in the text and what is not in the text. But, but the biblical text... Uh, is obviously largely narrative and it lends itself to storytelling and stories thrive on details and layers and nuance. And so as a preacher is filling out uh, the gaps in the story, uh, very much like a rabbinic exegete, uh, that's how I saw those two processes in conversation that the sanctified imagination is the midrashic practice of black preaching. As a preacher does that, She or he is careful to let the congregation know uh, that they are, to use your word, going to riff. And so that gives the congregation um, permission to trust this preacher as they say something that's going to be wild and incredulous and know that the preacher is being responsible to the text. Um, And so um, it can take any kind of form. I remember someone uh, preaching about um, maybe Jehu in his chariot and the rims on his chariot were dubs, you know, 22-inch wheels like you might have on a, on a go-fast car now, or the, um, what did someone say, the 24-karat gold sundial Rolex, right? It was, uh, <laughs> yeah. Just all, all kinds of things to create the portrait of, you know, lavishness on this on this person, but it can also go deeper. One of the examples I use about Bathsheba, uh, Bathsheba and David is that uh, as she lived with him after this rape and this pregnancy that ultimately resulted in, a, in a, dis, a stillborn child, that she determined uh, never to bow her head and never to stoop her shoulders. And she walked upright all the days of her life, but David could never meet her eyes. Um, so obviously that's an extrapolation and an exercise of the sanctified imagination, uh, but it's anchored in the part of the text in which David is condemned and convicted, uh, for raping her. And she is neither accused, uh, nor condemned, nor convicted by God nor Nathan, uh, in spite of bad preaching. She's not accused of adultery. There were penalties for adultery and none of that is on the table, uh, God does not send the prophet to her. And we know, if anything, the biblical text never hesitates to call a woman an adulteress, a harlot, or anything else. So the fact that she committed no crime, but the crime commi- was committed against her, is why I construct that particular uh, exegesis that David walked with that shame. But she knew she had nothing of which to be ashamed. Yeah, I thought that was a really powerful um, exegesis, midrashic exegesis of that uh, story. And and you asked a question in in that that section about how she could go on to um, to be the mother of four children for David after he had raped her and murdered her husband. So that's that's one of the questions you were wrestling with. Um, and and you said. Um, and, and this again was part of the Midrash. So this is uh, Bathsheba speaking. You are not going to shut me away as you did your first ri- wife, Michal. You stole the life I had with my husband in the sight of God, the man I love, the husband I chose to live with. You stole our future and you stole our children. I can't get that back, but I can have your children and the security that comes with them. I will be the mother of kings. So that's part of her walking with her head held high. Um, I thought that was a great line. I will be the mother of kings, which of course she goes on to be the um, 
help, she's, she's with Nathan um, helping to get Solomon on the throne. Uh, powerful story. Um, so you do deal with narratives, but you also deal with law as well. So what, what does a, a womanist midrash, midrashic approach have to offer us uh, in terms of a reading of a book like Leviticus? So one of the things that this work wanted to do overall was not so much put women back on the page, but uh, expose women on the page. Uh, women are present so often in expressions like the people, the nation, the Canaanites, the Israelites. And even when the law is written in masculine terms, grammatically speaking, the Ten Commandments are masculine singular. You, sir, will not commit adultery. You, sir, will not steal. You, sir, uh, will not murder. Uh, we know that those things were equally binding to women. So part of what I did dealing with those kind of tarot was to write them to and for women uh, or to uh, expand them for women and men uh, so that people could see how they applied. And in some cases, to uh, write the text with regard to women uh, so that people could imagine through the lens of gender how this might be different. So uh, Leviticus is a public health text, I argue, and when a person looks like they may have come in contact with some kind of pathogen, you know, you've broken out with spots or flakes or your hair's fallen out or there's something going on with your skin, there's examination, there's quarantine. Um, and in some of that, uh, you shave off all your hair, that helps with diagnosis. And by rewriting those passages so that it was just happening to a woman, uh, because of the way we think about women, women's bodies, women's beauty, uh, to imagine this woman having her head shaved, having her eyebrows shaved off. Um, the text reads differently when you're constantly reminded that this happens to a woman. Another example is there's a passage in Leviticus about a stubborn and rebellious son. Uh, you know, he won't do right, and you try to make him do right, but ultimately you may have to cast him off. Well, of course, women could be stubborn and rebellious, even though the text doesn't call for stubborn and rebellious children or stubborn and rebellious daughters. So I wrote a duplicate passage. Uh, everything that was said about the stubborn and rebellious son, I wrote a passage for a stubborn and rebellious daughter. So uh, exposing where women are in these narratives, that was one of my approaches uh, with the legal material. Yeah, I, I thought that was helpful. And, and you also... Um... One of the other things I liked about your careful attention to syntax and grammar is the, the way you let awkwardness sit in, in the text. Um, and, and you had an interesting midrash on Leviticus 15.18, um, which in Hebrew, it's, it's fairly broken in the way it, um, it reads. And you read that as a sort of um, bashfulness on the part of the writer. So you say, yeah, yes. uh, I, th I thought that was really interesting. And you say, um, uh, I, I can hear the speaker stumbling over these words. And a woman who, um, you know, gestures with hands, when a man lies down with more gesturing, and anyhow, you get ejaculation, both should wash and be apart from the community until the next day. Whew, wipes face. What's next on the list? <laughs> Okay. Well, one of the things that I think contemporary readers miss about the biblical text in translation is that there are a number of performance pieces, that they're pieces that only make sense when enacted and there are accompanying gestures. So even in Genesis, um, when God is naming things, and it's not that God called the light day. It's that God called to the light day. And that makes sense if you imagine an anthropomorphic God. God calls to the light and points holy shining finger, finger at this ball of shiningness and day, you are day. And God gestures to the darkness, you are darkness. That gesture fills the space 
of the grammar. And there are a number of places where it's clear that uh, a text works best as a, as a pageant, as a performance piece. So do you think the Bible requires Midrash to some extent? Yes, Midrash's interpretation. Uh, the root of Midrash, Drash, uh, is the primary word for interpretation. All literatures, all media, all experiences require interpretation. We do the work of interpretation whether we know it or not. Biblical text requires intentional, thoughtful interpretive work that is grounded in the context plural of the text, the, the literary context of the story, the context of production, um, and in the context in which the text will be read and interpreted. Um, simply reading a line and assuming it means what it meant, or even assuming you know what it meant because the words are familiar and we have those words uh, in our world, um, those readings can often go astray by not taking into account uh, what that language meant in its time. If What advice would you give uh, to listeners who want to cultivate their sanctified imagination? Well, the sanctified imagination uh, is a preaching practice of the black church. It's not for everyone. Um, but people can ask questions of the text, ask what's missing, who's missing, how did we get from here to there, how much time passed between this verse and the next verse, what were the stories of this person's life, um, what's not being told. Um, there are a thousand and one questions that can be asked of any text. Um, and while the sanctified imagination is specific to black preaching culture, there are ways in which readers from other cultural backgrounds uh, can certainly use their imagination. Um, I wouldn't call it midrash if a person hasn't been trained in uh, rabbinic literature and has no access to the Hebrew language. But even writing a story uh, and imagining uh, conversation between characters, sometimes those exercises help you identify what's not missing in the story. I mean, what is missing in the story, the things you feel a need to uh, create or explain or have discussed in conversation, draw you back to those gaps in the text uh, and further questions of the text. So it's, it's really a circular process. It draws you deeper into the text. Your, your questions beget more questions. You turn back to the text. And ultimately, that's one of my goals. Increased biblical literacy, increased interest in and passion for the biblical text. Hmm. Do you have another character that you covered that you'd like to highlight? Oh my goodness, there's so many. I will use a group. The second half of the book is the royal women of Israel and Judah. And going back to our early conversation about there being 111 named women in the Hebrew scriptures, among them are a good two dozen royal women uh, who English readers turn, tend to call queens. I talk about while that language doesn't work in the uh, social world of the Israelites. That's another example of a word you think you know, but it doesn't mean what you think it means in the context of the Hebrew Bible. And even though there are often very tiny references dealing with uh, the birth of a future king, um, these women are there, and by looking at where they are in the text and where they are not, you're able to determine fairly immediately that the royal mother is a significant person in the monarchy of Judah because they uh, are insistent about listing them uh, throughout the genealogies of the kings, whereas on the uh, northern monarchy, in the Israelite monarchy, when there are two separate entities, that's not an important figure, and you don't get those names, and you don't get anything of their stories told unless there's some sort of traumatic event. So simply by attending to where are the names and what do they have in common, that tells you something about the political structure of the monarchy. 
uh, that most readers thinking about the Hebrew biblical text as patriarchal and hierarchical would not necessarily think that there is a structured regular office for mm. royal women. Mm. And what did that office involve? Well, it involved advising uh, the king. The, the queen mother is the mother of the king and not uh, the wife of a king. And so one becomes queen mother when one's son ascends to the throne. And so that means that woman is some number of years, decade or more, more than a decade, you know, 15, 20, maybe even 30 years older than the child. Sometimes you have, you have an actual child or infant ascend to the throne and then the queen mother is a, is a regent. But she functions as an advisor. Um, and there were some other duties that we're not clear about, but we know that there were official duties because one of the queen mothers, Ma'aka, and Ma'aka is the most common woman's name in the Hebrew Bible, and there are more of them than there are Marys in the New Testament, so they can be difficult to sort out. But there's a narrative about uh, Queen Mother Ma'aka being sat down from her official duties because she got tangled up with some some idols. So what that tells us is idol worship is a firing offense. That makes sense in the Hebrew Bible. But if it's a firing offense, that means uh, her role and duties as queen mother were sufficiently structured to be regarded as a position from which one could be fired, right? So uh, that's an example. Yeah, fascinating. And would you be uh, willing to share about your current work, what you're working on right now? Certainly. I am working on a lectionary that I'm writing uh, in partnership with the Episcopal Church. It will be published by Church, Church House, which is our Episcopal publisher. This lectionary is a schedule for preaching for those uh, who are not from lectionary churches. Uh, the vast majority of Christians in Catholic, Orthodox, Anglican, Episcopalian, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Methodist and some American Baptist congregations and individual pastors, sometimes UCC, uh, use a schedule of preaching that is a three-year schedule that goes through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then John gets sprinkled through all three years like seasoning. And in that preaching schedule, there's a first lesson that is Hebrew Bible or Acts of the Apostle uh, during Pentecost, a psalm, a New Testament lesson, which is basically anything but the gospel, and then a gospel. So four lessons a day. Uh, many churches read all four. Some preachers only read the ones they're going to preach. And so that set of four lessons a Sunday, 52 Sundays a year, plus uh, a similar pattern of readings for every day in Holy Week, all the festivals of the year, Christmas, Easter, etc., so I am choosing an entirely new selection of texts for all of these preaching days on the Christian calendar, texts that feature or include women. And I'm translating these texts, which is taking a lot of time. In addition to featuring women, um, the Psalms are going to be explicitly feminine. So there will, if there are pronouns, there will only be feminine pronouns. Throughout, I'm using expansive language for God, titles like uh, the fire of Sinai, ever-living God, the eternal uh, source of life, font of creation. I am not using uh, masculine and hierarchical language like Lord in either testament. Uh, I talk about how that title is actually a human title that gets applied to God, and it's the title of slave owners. And so I'm not using that kind of language. So uh, pairing these texts in new ways, translating them afresh so that when women are visible in structures like the Israelites, the people of the land, uh, it reads, the women, men, and children of Israel went out to visit the women, men, and children of Canaan. Um, when lineages are given rather than the God of Jacob, it's the God of Rebecca's lineage. And so for each place that I do a gender expansion, I make a text note so the reader knows exactly what was in the text there. So the, we have the calendar of preaching, 
the translations, the text notes, which also include your, your regular text notes. Well, this verb can do this or do that, that sort of grammatical information, and then a bit of preaching props. And so the traditional pattern is three years. In addition to those three years, I'm doing a year W for congregations that don't use this kind of preaching schedule, but a pastor that wants to preach a year of women, but not miss out on any gospels. Because if you picked one of the other three years, you would get focus on one gospel. So my year W goes through all four gospels somewhat evenly. They will be published. Uh, you're getting a uh, hot off the press uh, update. Uh, they will be published in four volumes now because our original two-volume plan was too fat. Uh, year A is at the publishing house. I'm waiting to do corrections on that. Oh, congrats. That's uh, great. Year W is almost done. We're down to October. So I expect year W to be done uh, by January. Year A is scheduled to come out in the spring of 2021. After uh, I finish year W, I'm going back to Womanist Midrash, and I'm going to do a second volume on women in the prophetic texts. After that, I'm going back to the lectionary, and we'll do years B and C. After that, I'm taking a nap. <laughs> Yeah, well, it sounds like... Um, On an uh, island. Yeah, uh, well, a well-deserved one. Well, that's exciting. I'm, I'm glad to hear it's coming out so so soon. And for that reason, 2021 um, hopefully will be uh, e even that much better uh, of a year. Um, so, uh, Dr. Gaffney, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us at OnScript today. Really appreciate your um, insights and reflections. And I definitely encourage uh, everyone to, to take a look at Womanist Midrash, a reintroduction to the women of the Torah and the throne. Thank you. You have been listening to OnScript, delectable conversations on scripture and theology. If this episode has brought you inner peace or lit your biblical fire, please consider a small donation of just 2 or $5 per month. Information on how to donate can be found at onscript.study slash donate. 